Hi, welcome to RSD Academy. I'm Bob Duhamel. Today I'm going to talk about capacitors and phase. Now, phase has to do with timing, how events are timed, one event compared to the other. And we usually talk about phasing when we're talking about alternating current. But if we take a close look at how a capacitor acts when it's charging and discharging under DC conditions, we can gain some insight that lays the foundation for understanding how capacitors work in alternating current. So let's go ahead and get started by reviewing what we already know about how capacitors charge and discharge. Let's take a look at our charge and discharge test circuit. So we have a capacitor, a couple of switches, and a battery and a resistor. And for our test circuit, we made this one ohm, one farad, one volt. And what we did is we closed this switch for charging and allowed the capacitor to charge. And we found that after one second with one ohm, one farad, and one volt, after one second, the voltage across the capacitor had reached 0 0.632 volts, or 63.2% of the source voltage. So that is one ohm and one farad, and if we charge for exactly one second, we reach 63.2% of whatever voltage this is. And we also saw that if we increase the resistance, let's say we double the resistance, we doubled the time it took to get to that voltage. Or if we doubled the capacitance, it also took twice as much time to reach that voltage, or if we doubled them both, it took four times as long to reach that voltage. So we determined that the time it takes for the capacitor to charge to 63.2% of the applied voltage was determined by the resistance multiplied by the capacitance. So once again, the resistance times the capacitance gives us the time in seconds that it takes for the capacitor to charge up to 63.2% of the applied voltage. And we called that tau, the Greek letter tau, which represents the capacitor time constant. And then we found if we charged for another second, it would reach 63.2% of the remaining voltage. So now if we take a look at our curve that we drew when we were looking at the charging and discharging characteristics, We have across the bottom our time constants. This is not seconds. This is intervals of time it takes to reach 63.2%, which again is tau, Greek letter tau for the time constant, and that's determined by R times C. So if it's one ohm and one farad, each of these will be one second. So there's one, two, three, four, and five. If we change the capacitor or the resistor, these are some other times. For example, again, we double the capacitance, then this is two seconds, four seconds, six seconds, etc. So that's the intervals of time it takes to reach the 63.2%. And up here is 100% of our source voltage. In this case, it was one volt. So that 100% would be one volt. Here's zero. And let's see, right about here, 25% about 75% and 25%. Yeah, let's try that again. How about 50% right there? Okay, so there is our scale. And we found that if we close the switch for exactly one second, assuming we had one ohm and one farad, after one second we had reached 63.2%, or if it was some other capacitor or resistor combination, we would have some other time, but after that one time constant, we reach 63.2% of our voltage. So that's after one time constant. After another time constant, we reach 63.2% of what's left over. So that's going to put us up somewhere right about there after two time constants. After three, we are up here, another 63.2% of what's left over. I'm not giving the actual numbers because, first of all, I keep forgetting them. And if you need to derive them, you can always calculate it out knowing that each time, for each time constant, 
you reach 63.2% of the remaining voltage. And so eventually we get down to five time constants and we have reached 99.1 or 2% of the source voltage. And at that point, let me get that out of the way, it can't charge anymore. So we basically flatline. So if it's a one ohm and one farad, this takes one, two, three, four, five seconds to reach there. If it's 100 ohms and 100 microfarads, it happens in a couple of milliseconds. Zoom. Happens really quickly. So that's what happens during the charge. And then we also determined that if we have the completely charged, I'm going to see if I can squeeze this in here. Uh, I want to make a point. I'm going to do this after five time constants, but I could do it any time. Once we have charged, we stay charged. And at some point, I'm going to flip the switch that causes the capacitor to discharge. And we found that after one time constant, we had lost 63.2%. So I'll put a minus sign there. We lose 63.2%. Where does that leave us? At, should be a lot lower here. Mm, about 36.8%. So right about there, would you say? So we flip the switch and start discharging. In one time constant, we lose 63.2%, leaving us with 36.8%. And each time constant, we lose another 63.2%. And then after five time constants, we are down to zero volts again. So that's the charge curve, and that's the discharge curve, and they're mirror images of each other. And it doesn't always have to take this shape. Remember, this could be flatlined for any amount of time, minutes, hours, whatever, and this starts when I start the discharge curve. So it's not a, this relationship of when this starts has, has to do with when I start the discharge, not anything that's always looking the same way. Okay, so that's what happens with the voltage. What happens with the current? Well, let's uh, erase this. And let's take a look at the way the capacitor acts with respect to the current flowing through the capacitor. So I'm going to just draw the part of the circuit we need for this. The capacitor. I'm not going to draw the discharge circuit because we don't need it just yet. So let's make this once again 1 volt, 1 farad, 1 ohm. Okay, so we're going to close the switch and start charging the capacitor. So what happens when we first close that switch? We get a surge of current flowing into the uncharged capacitor. And we're using conventional current, so that's basically we're looking at positive charges moving in this direction. So those positive charges start piling up on this plate of the capacitor, and they drive positive charges away from the other side. So we're piling up positive charges here, driving them away, so this becomes more positive than this, or better said, higher voltage and lower voltage. So we end up with a polarity where this side is positive, this side is negative, and we start to build up a voltage on there. But let's look at what happens at the moment we flip the switch. So let's erase this, redraw the capacitor here, and we're going to flip that switch. And at that moment, current starts flowing into the capacitor and at the same time current flows out of the capacitor. So a surge of current is going in, a surge of current is going out. Looks to me like current is flowing right through the capacitor. Of course it's not. The electricity is piling up on this side and being pushed off on that side. But sure looks to me like current's flowing through the capacitor. So what does the capacitor look like right now? It looks like this. A short circuit. So at the moment I flip the switch, the capacitor looks like nothing, just looks like a short circuit. And so we have a surge of current going through. How much current is that going to be? Well, it's not hard to figure out. We have one volt and one ohm. And so we are going to have, flowing through here, one amp of current. Now let's uh, take a look at what happens after one time constant. Let's put the capacitor back in there. And after one time constant, what has happened? This has built up enough charge that we now have 63.2% of that voltage. So it's 0.632 volts across that capacitor. 
And let's get this out of the way. So, how much current is flowing through that capacitor? Do we have enough information to figure that out? Well, not quite, but we're close and we can get the rest of the information we need. So this is 0.632 volts. That is one volt. What does Kirchhoff's voltage law say about the distribution of voltage through the circuit? It says that that voltage will be distributed proportionally among the components. So I have two components, 0.632 volts here. Where's the rest of the voltage? It has to be here. So across the resistor, I have 0 0.368 volts. And if I add those together, discounting any rounding errors, that's going to add up to one volt. So there's Kirchhoff's voltage law. It doesn't change. At the time that we reach one time constant, in this case, one second, I have 63.2% of my voltage here and 36.8% of my voltage here, adding up to 100% of the voltage there. So now I know I have 0.368 volts and 1 ohm, what's the current through there going to be? Well, if you know your voltage, you divide into it. So 0.368 divided by 1 equals 0 0.368 amps or 368 milliamps. So now I know what current is flowing through that capacitor. So when I first flipped the switch, I had 1 amp, but when I hit 6.32 or 63.2%, or 0.632 volts, now I have 1 volt pushing this way, 0.632 volts pushing that way, and so I no longer have as much current, so my current has dropped down to 36.8% of my original, which was 1 amp. And of course what's going to happen is as I go more and more time constants, this is going to go up, so that voltage will go down. The voltage across this resistor gets lower, so I get less current across the resistor. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it, of course, is that as this voltage goes up, it's pushing back more, so I get less and less current until this eventually reaches 99 or 99.99% or let's say 9.999 volts. For all intents and purposes, we have reached one volt. So this is pushing back as hard as that one is pushing. I no longer have any current flowing. I no longer have any voltage across here. Why not? Well, to get voltage across that resistor, what do I need? I need resistance and current flow to get voltage across it. I have resistance, but no current flow, therefore no voltage across it. So I have one volt here, zero volts here, adds up to one volt. Kirchhoff's voltage law is still working. But now what does that capacitor look like? It looks like exactly what it is. Two conductors separated by an insulator. There's no current flowing through it. So now the capacitor looks like an open circuit. So when I first flip the switch, the capacitor looks like a short circuit. While it's charging, it looks like a resistor. A variable resistor that is getting bigger and bigger as the capacitor charges. Now, of course, the capacitor is storing energy and a resistor doesn't, so it's not the same. But if all we can see is the voltages and can't tell that that capacitor is actually storing energy, we can't tell that that's not a variable resistor just getting higher and higher in resistance. So when we first flip the switch, the capacitor looks like a short circuit. As it is charging, it looks like a variable resistor that's getting bigger and bigger, and then finally when it's completely charged, the capacitor looks like what a capacitor is. Conductors separated by an insulator, an open circuit, and that's what we have. Let's go and take a look at what happens with this looking at the graph we had. Let's draw our graph. Here's our time constants, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Here's our percentage of voltage across the capacitor, 0, 50%, 25%, 75%. And let's look at the voltage as it charges after one time constant. It's going to go to 63.2, so what do you think, right about there? After two time constants, it's going to go 63.2% of what's left over. So what about right about there? 
Three time constants, another 63.2% of what's left over. Four and five. And so there is the curve that we are already familiar with. And then it will just stay flat because once it charges up, it can't go anymore. And we just simply have 100% of our voltage across it. The current, remember when I flipped that switch, the capacitor looks like a short circuit. And with one ohm and one farad and one volt, I get a one amp of current. So let's put that up here in red. That's going to be one amp. That's our greatest current. That's 100% of our current. What's going to happen after one time constant? Well, remember the voltage went up and the current was going down. So we lose 63.2% of our current. That's going to put us right about there. So there's our loss in current, leaving 36.8% or 0.368 amps. And then after another time constant, we lose another 63.2% down to, well, like I say, I don't remember these numbers off the top of my head, but we lose 63.2% of this voltage going down to that point, then there, then there, and then finally after five time constants, we are down to zero current. So as the capacitor charges, the voltage goes up and the current goes down. So quick review, we flip the switch, there's no voltage across the capacitor, but we have a surge of current. We get our maximum current. The capacitor looks like a short circuit. After one time constant, the capacitor is charged up to 63.2% of our source voltage. But now our current has dropped down because the capacitor is charging and it's blocking that current. So not as much current is flowing. We're down to 36.8%. The voltage continues to go up until it's 100%. Current continues to go down until the capacitor is fully charged. Now it looks like what it is, an open circuit, and no current is flowing through it. Now let's look at the timing relationship between the current and the voltage. And notice that first, the first thing that happens, we have current but no voltage. After some time, we have voltage but no current. So First, now we have current represented by I equals our maximum current, but our voltage represented by E equals zero. So there's time zero. We have maximum current and no voltage, but later on it's flopped. Now we have, let's go all the way to the end here just because we can. At the end, after about five time constants, our current equals zero. But now our voltage is equal to its maximum voltage. So notice first we have current, then we have voltage. So current is represented by I, voltage is represented by E, and this is a capacitive circuit, so we'll put that in the middle. So the word ICE is an acronym that can remind us that in a capacitive circuit we have current then we have voltage. So current comes before voltage in a capacitive circuit. This is usually something we talk about in alternating current, but this shows that in direct current, where the relationship comes from, where this current before voltage comes from that we talk about in AC actually happens in DC. When we charge the capacitor, first we have current, then we have voltage in a capacitive circuit. So remember ICE, current before voltage in a capacitive circuit. Now let's look at something interesting that happens when we discharge the capacitor. Let's draw our circuit up there again to talk about it. One volt one farad, one ohm, and this is down so the capacitor is fully charged. Now let's take a look at what happens. Well first let's look at what's going on when the capacitor is charging. Notice the direction of current. The current is flowing in that direction. Now once the capacitor is fully charged we have no current. Now let's open the switch and there's no path for the current to flow, but now we're going to close this switch. Now this 
capacitor is going to act like what? It's going to act like a battery. Now, of course, it's not the same as a battery. It doesn't have the chemical energy store that a battery has, so it won't last nearly as long. But it just looks like a battery that discharges very quickly. So what's going to happen the moment we close that switch? Well, the current's going to flow from positive to negative, once again, conventional current. So the current is going to flow in this direction. So when it was charging, the current was flowing in that direction. Now that it's discharging, the current is flowing in the opposite direction. And so let's also put a voltmeter across here and look at the voltage. Let's make this the red lead. And that the black lead. So what's going to happen when we're charging? Current is flowing this direction. And we know that when conventional current encounters a resistance or any other kind of of opposition to current flow, we get a backup of voltage where the current enters the resistance and a drop in voltage where it exits. So we get a higher voltage here and a lower voltage there. Therefore, that is positive and that is negative. Remember, positive simply means that this voltage is higher than that voltage. So a positive voltage is simply a higher voltage than some other voltage that we call negative. So positive to negative because the current's flowing in that direction. But then when we discharge, the current is now going the opposite direction. So what do we see? Well, now this becomes positive and that becomes negative and our voltage is going to register a negative voltage of some sort. Uh, in fact, when it first starts out, we have one ohm and our voltage source. So we're going to have negative one amp. Oh, this is going to be negative one volt. Negative one volt. And that's how we measure current in a circuit like this, because how do you measure current in a capacitor? Well, we can measure current anywhere in the circuit, but we'll notice that as long as we keep the voltmeter oriented the same, we get a positive voltage that way and a negative voltage that way, and we extrapolate that to current. So we have one volt, one ohm, that's one amp. So when the current's flowing that way, we get positive one amp. And when the current is flowing that way, we have negative one amp. Can you have negative current? Yes, a negative current is simply a current that's going the opposite direction of a positive current. So let's take a look at what happens, remembering that when we're charging, the current's flowing that direction, and when we're discharging, the current is flowing that direction. Let's take a look at what happens on our graph. Now we're going to draw the graph in such a way that we can get uh, negative currents, negative voltages too if we needed to. So there's zero, and there's a uh, 100% of our voltage, and it's also going to be 100% of our current. Just draw that right there. Okay, we'll just do a quick drawing of this. Uh, I'll put some marks here. One, two, three, four, five. There's our time constants. Let's draw a few more of those. So there's 10 time constants, and we're going to go ahead and charge that capacitor. So after about five time constants, it's fully charged and stays there. And what I'm going to do now in discharge, I could do it any time. I could do it here. I could do it hours later. But I'm going to do it right at five time constants just to fit it in. So I could discharge here. That's where a curve would look like, and we'd get that shape. But I'm going to move it sooner and just have it happen right at this point. And let's take a look at our current real quickly, too. So we started our maximum current. And that discharges down to our minimum current, and that'll stay zero current until I do something else. Now what I'm going to do is start discharging that capacitor. So the voltage is going to start dropping down after one time constant. After one time constant, we lose 63.2%, really need to go further than that. Another time constant more more, 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 and eventually our voltage goes to zero. What happens to our current? Well, remember, when we were fully charged, how much current did we have? Zero. Now we're going to flip the switch. What happens? Draw it down here real quickly. That capacitor, let's draw it as a capacitor. Put our switch here. We close that switch, and what's the capacitor look like? It looks like a battery, and so we get a surge of current. So at the moment we flip that switch, we get a surge of current. Does the current go back up? 
Well, we could if we were talking about absolute current, but we're talking about positive and negative current. So we're going to graph our negative current as going lower than zero current. So the current suddenly drops down to minus one amp, assuming that it's uh, assuming that we had a one volt battery and we have a one ohm resistor. So it suddenly suddenly jumps down to minus one amp, and then as it discharges, it gets less and less negative and approaches zero amps. So when it's charging, first we have current and no voltage, then we have voltage and no current. Then when we discharge, our voltage drops down and our current drops down and eventually reaches zero. So that's an interesting thing that happens as we get negative current. Now I could have drawn that as a positive current, then I'm talking about absolute numbers, and I don't want to get into mathematics and all of what that means, but uh, to be practical, since the current reverses direction, we call that a negative current, so I'm going to put that there. And now if we use an oscilloscope, we'll talk about oscilloscopes in the AC course, but an oscilloscope gives you a picture of how voltage changes over time. And lo and behold, remember how we measure the current? We have the resistor and the capacitor, put the little switch here, and we put a voltmeter across here. It's a funky looking voltmeter, there it is, volt. And we measure the voltage and extrapolate the current from that. After all, what does a digital voltmeter do? It measures voltage and then you extrapolate the current. So we measure the voltage and extrapolate the current, and when it's charging, the voltage is positive. When it's discharging, the voltage is negative. And since an oscilloscope gives you a picture of the voltage, this is exactly what you would see on an oscilloscope. The voltage across the resistor, and therefore the current from the capacitor, will start high, positive, go down to zero, then flip polarity, and then go back down to zero again. So this is actually what you would see on an oscilloscope if you measure the current using this method. So just a quick review. If we draw that circuit again, I'll draw it over here and hope it's big enough for you to see. Here's our battery, our switch, resistor, capacitor, and discharge switch. So when we first start charging the capacitor, we flip this switch, the capacitor looks like what? It looks like a short circuit. After charging for a while, it looks like a variable resistor that is getting greater in resistance. Of course, again, it's a capacitor, therefore it's storing energy, so it's not a resistor. But if all we can look at is the voltages and the currents, how can we tell the difference? So while it's charging, it looks like a variable resistor that's getting more and more resistance. And then once it's fully charged, the capacitor looks like an open circuit. So when we close the switch, it's a short circuit. After it charges, it looks like an open circuit. As far as the current is concerned, when we first close the switch, we have a surge of current. So we have our greatest current when we close the switch. And the circuit is essentially this battery and that resistor. That we can calculate the current from the battery and the resistor. As it charges up, the current gets lower and lower and lower. And eventually, when it's completely charged, we have maximum voltage and zero current. Then when we discharge, the current reverses direction, therefore we have negative current. We suddenly have a surge of current again, but the voltage and current come back down together as it discharges. Now alternating current, we would essentially do this over and over again, except we actually flip the polarity of the voltage source, which changes what things happen here, and I don't want to get into that now because that's for the AC course. But this gives us an idea of why in alternating current, the current and the voltage act the way they do when we have a capacitor involved. So as usual, if you think this video was useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel and helps people who are looking for these kinds of videos find them. And please keep those comments coming. I really appreciate them. I wish I had time to answer more of the questions. I just don't have much time. Sometimes other people answer the questions. I answer as many as I can. But that also helps the channel a lot. And if you would like to help put these videos online and make RSD Academy possible, you can go to patreon.com slash join slash RSD Academy and pledge your support. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. And don't forget that RSD Academy is a free online vocational school where you can study electronics technology and prepare for a career as a certified electronics technician. Again, a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon and to everyone for watching. And don't forget the ice. 
the voltage of 